OK, cool. So hi, guys. Um, I'm Alvaro Leiva. I'm a production engineer at Facebook and Instagram. And I'm here to talk to you about how about we use systemd in high-level languages. Um, systemd is already written in C, so that's already a high-level language. But I'm talking like higher-level languages, like uh, Python, Node API, sorry, Node, yeah, Node, JavaScript, PHP, all those languages that are not uh, really like nuanced and stuff. OK, cool. So um, basically, this, this talk will have like two, two portions. One is how we, as Facebook, did a library that talks to systemd directly instead of shelling out, and then a few fun things that we do with it. Um, the idea of this presentation is not to say, hey, guys, go and use our library. It's more on the sense like, hey, like this is all the things that we learn by creating this library. You should all go and create your own libraries in your own languages. And if you also want to do one in Python, that's the one that I'm going to present, go for it. Like, this is really fun, and this is something that we can all learn from. So let me start with the initial journey on how we start with this. So um, this started basically when we were at Instagram. Uh, we needed to migrate all of our fleet to CentOS 7 because that was part of the of what Facebook was doing. Davida has talked about this for two years now. He promised this that we <laughs> he promised in in this year that we have already done this and we were one of the last groups to do this. And the reason why it was hard for us is because we had a lot of maintenance scripts that rely on the underneath uh, service manager. Um, one of the things that we typically do is that we would execute stuff like etc init d Cassandra status and then we parse the output and then that's how we decided if Cassandra was running or not running and all the things. And so all the things that were not really, no, it's not that we're not possible, but that was not a good idea to do it with systemd. Um, and for good reasons. Uh, so for instance, systemd comes with systemctl status, which is really great for humans, but it's really hard to parse the output. Um, and systemd does provide like a lot of toolings to do this from the command line. Like even systemctl has a child status that will kind of as you like individual fields. Uh, you can also use bus.ctl and all those stuff. Uh, but if you are in a high level language, again, I use this like a synonym for Python, uh, to do this, you have to chill out. And at least for my personal experience, chilling out, I've, I've considered it a little bit clowny on those things. So it would be really nice to have like a really nice and native interface to talk to system D. Um, yeah. So it basically all starts with Divas, right? So um, from an external developer, not a systemd developer, but from an external developer that want to interact with systemd, this is, for me, the best decision that could have ever gone into systemd, like using Divas as a way to interface uh, to interface with systemd. Uh, this basically allows external services to communicate through this daemon and and get all the information that you need from it uh, in a way that is not as clowny or hacky as like executing a command, getting a text out, parsing the text, and then if that text is supposed to be like a PID, convert that into string, sorry, convert that into an integer that is, has its own problems. So it was really kind of a surprise to me when I started working with this that this is also how systemd uh, most internal tools work. And it's kind of because we all know that Divas, the Divas daemon is not present at every stage of the, of, the, of the machine. Like It's not really present at the beginning and at the end, shut down and, and start. But for most general things, this is how you communicate. Uh, this is how even systemd tooling communicate. So for instance, like, if you go and read systemd code, which I'm assuming that everybody here has done it. Um, you will like see all this type of code, like systemctl uh, communicates to the manager, uh, systemd run, which is something that I really like to use and abuse, also communicate uh, through divas to start the transient units. And even machine CTL, like instead of telling out or changing namespace or doing other things that you could do, uh, just communicate to the uh, divas daemon running inside the machine. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to get corrected about this, but at least this is how I view it from the outside. So Divas is like really great, and it's something that that we could really use. And in general, like if you forget all about this and you need a really good IPC layer to communicate, like use Divas. Uh, it's really reliable. I would suspect people can tell you otherwise. So 
Since everything starts with Divas, like, if you are going to interact with systemd from a high-level language, you should literally just start with Divas. So let's see a little bit how Divas things work. Um, so systemd comes with a nice tool that is BASCTL. BASCTL, um, when you execute it without any command, it will just show you all the services that are running on your system. And these are all things that you already know, since like systemd1 or hostname, that is called the reverse domain Something. I sorry. I I black out of that. Um, well, basically, these are all the services, right? If you go and explore one of these services, you will see objects. And objects, you can always look at this like name of instantiated attributes or, or instantiated uh, objects on on the system. Uh, for instance, for system D, these are all the objects that you can connect. And then you see, even though they have like weird names, they all in target or service. So, if you don't know anything, how this thing works, but you have only worked with systemd those doing like start creating units and stuff like that, you will start to see like there is a certain resembles and this looks like a really programmatic way to access this, this data. Um, so if you go and actually do an introspect into this, you will see that uh, it has interfaces that has names that are really similar to what you would expect them to have. Like if I'm expecting, if I'm, if I'm inspecting the service, uh, a service unit, you will expect that I will have org.freedesktop.systemd.service. And then inside those, you have methods and properties. And I'm pretty sure that this is really known for everybody, but at least when I started this, this was all new. So I think it's at least worth uh, mentioning it. A uh, method is just a fancy way to say functions. It's something that you will call and will return you know, something that you can give arguments to it. And properties, it's, again, it's another fancy word for just saying a property is something, an attribute that your object has. And it can change through times. So I always think of properties like functions that you call without arguments. Even even though that is not true, but that's a really mental model that I have. So the thing that make a divas a divas object um, that you actually uh, that makes this really powerful are the three interfaces that are at the beginning. The first interface is the one that we're gonna start abusing, and it was the one that made possible to actually create a library. Was the introspectable that allows you to, without knowing anything except the address and the object, this will give you the, all the information that you have to reconstruct the object and actually interface with it. Peer and properties are things that are there and are really cool uh, that we're not gonna touch really much, but no, you can also use it. Okay, cool. So introspect. Introspect is a method of that interface that if you call it, you will get an XML representation of the object. And once you have an XML representation of the object, anyone who has lived through the 90s knows that you can construct anything, right? Because SOAP did it, so why can't we do it with Divas? So in theory, that's all you need to do to work with it. So how do you call it? I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm using a systemd library. Uh, there's nothing in my talk so far that talks about systemd. I'm just talking about divas, but I'm getting ahead. So basically, you call that method, and then you will get something like this, that is the XML. And you see that it gives me interfaces, a list of interfaces. Inside, you have properties that has the type that it will return. It has the type of a... Uh, it has a real name that you will use to, uh, as, as a unique identifier for the property. And then you have methods. And methods can not take arguments, or they can take arguments. And then you have arguments with uh, the types and the basically the direction. Is there in? Is arguments that you give? Uh, you also have like the return types that is eventually defined somewhere. Um, so some implementation of of Tivas also returns the name of the argument. That is kind of useful. I, I mean, I would prefer that it were there, but if it's not there, it's not a big deal. So we now have a way to construct things. So when we were going to start building this library, we had to find like underneath libraries that we wanted to use. Um, the, again, I'm a Python developer. If you haven't noticed by the 100 times that I say Python, but so. I wanted to use Divas Python because it has Python in it and it also has Divas. It makes sense. The problem is that that is a binding to lib Divas that is really old, that is basically written exactly like a month later after the implementation of, uh, of a specification of Divas was written. So it's it doesn't have all the experience that we have now that we now this protocol is pretty mature. And also the main author of this, this library sets a disclaimer that says. Divas Python might not be the best Divas binding for you to use. So if the author says don't use it, then thank you. 
I will move on. OK, the next one was PyDivas, which also is, is based on GDivas. And it was, really, it was a really good alternative that I wanted to use. But with that said, I spent a few times uh, reading Leonard's blog, and I find SDBus as part of the system, the implementation. Um, and this was actually the best thing that we wanted to use. So we wanted to create a library to bind to systemd, not to link to, D to Divas. Divas was the protocol. And using this thing will basically give us the same way that systemd itself bins to Divas and do everything. And also, it gives you a little way of cheat in the sense that I could just go to systemd and read the code and understand how this does, and then I could implement it on my script in Python and say, hey, I created something, but no, I didn't. Um, for your language, if you want to do it, there's this page over here. There's some free desktop that has all the bindings for many languages. You should go and, again, write this in Ruby. Have fun. OK, so um, the great thing is that, OK, so we want to use SDVAS. There's no Python library for SDVAS. In fact, there's no Python library to bin to live system D. Uh, I mean, there's not, there is not. There's few libraries. Uh, none of them did whatever we want. So as all developers do, when they can't find something, they just build them themselves. So we at Facebook created PSTMD. Uh, PSTMD is a pun of words because it sounds like systemd, but also start with Py, as every Python library should. Uh, so yeah, naming things is hard. This was easy. Great. Other options were PID1, which basically is PID1, but in Spanish. So yeah, we did it. Yeah. OK. So. Uh, yeah, so basically, we did it because we wanted to bin to SDBus, but we also want, now that now that we're binning to systemd, we could bin to other libraries that were present, like SDDemon, and do all the things that David had talked on his talk. That was really cool. So how does this work? Uh, we basically Python this library, connects to Divas, get the information, and you generate classes. Nothing far of the ordinary. I'm pretty sure that everybody can come out in five minutes with code version of what this does. But here's the fun thing that you learn while you are translating basically something that was written in C into Python, is that there are C-isms or Pythonisms that you need to translate from one language to another. For instance, in C, there is no propagation of exception. So you see this pattern all the time when you read code. You, make, you call to a method that returns a exit status and there are side effects on the arguments. And then you need to check for the return status to get, to get a... Um, you need, sorry, you need to check for the exit status to realize if you need to fail or continue. And then if this method is returned by another method, then that method also needs to check. And then there's this propagation that you have to explicitly do. In Python and other languages where you do have exception propagation, you, all you need to do is like check the exit status of the first time that you call the command that actually has this behavior, and then you raise. And when, when you raise the exception, that will bubble up everywhere else. So you don't, if you want to stop, when something fails, you don't do anything. You just let the application or the virtual VM uh, does that for you. Uh, if you do want to stop, sorry, if you don't want to stop, then you just try accept uh, your errors. So that's one cool thing that, that you get. And then you're going to see this difference if you ever look to my code that I raise a lot instead of checking. And then I try accept a lot. Uh, the other thing is that uh, system D at least from my point of view, it's really written in a way that it looks like it's supposed to be like object-oriented, but it's not, because C is not. So you usually give like this struct at the beginning uh, of almost all the calls. So this really lends to when you are translating this into a language that is object-oriented, like heavily object-oriented, heavily object -oriented, you get into those things. Uh, so you have a class SDBus that should be like, then you delete the first name, and then you just uh, rename all the method, and then they call self. The idea of doing this is that if somebody is, read, is used to write Python, this comes really natural. And if something is used to write C and wants to write these things, but in Python, because somebody asked him to, uh, it doesn't have to learn that, so much new things. It just needs to learn that it needs to replace sdbus underscore with sdbus and then a dot. That's not that big of a deal. So now, how this look? It's basically you install as everything with pip install pstandy. Then you call it like that, and it looks very really simple. Like if you do org.freedesktop.systemd1, you will install, install it, sorry, call it from pstmd.python, and then you call the unit. And then you start the unit in this really Pythonic way where you don't have any information about how it is, and this will construct everything. And then you can start, 
and stop it. And this thing over here encodes the idea of the interface um, that is completely um, evaluated when you call for the first time unit. Um, now, this is, again, this is, you can do it. You could, like, if you know C, you can even do it in C. There's nothing magic about this. The great thing is that now, for a Python developer or, or, a, or these developers that are high level, um, that they have never touched C and they also don't want to touch C, you give them like a really nice interface to do stuff that they first didn't know how to do, or that they will chill out and then do a really hacky and, let's face it, clowny way to, to, to get the output. So these things are cool. Also, once you call this method that it basically automatically calculates the thing that it needs to replace, put it on the bus and everything, you also get the, out, the real uh, return value of the thing that it in this case would be a job. So then you can verify like the job through the bus and everything right, tight nicely and then you don't have to do any experimentation. I say that I really think I said that I really think that system D was uh, really good uh, at making the decision of running Divas. The other thing that I really think system D does really good is giving you output or information about your service and I'm preaching to the choir probably but um but when you do system CTL status you get all this information and sometimes you actually want this to to do you in your code so you do the same thing and then you ask the main PID. and again the main PID, you you get it as a, as a integer because this thing is typed. But then with PistonD, you... Ooh, fun animations. Okay, so with PistonD, <laughs> you, you can do... A, you can actually, like, do socket activation. I mean, you don't do it with socket activation, but you read the information from, from socket activation when you just get the same headers that you would get uh, by paying them with, uh, with systemd. And you do socket from FT, and then now a Python developer and... I'm maybe I'm selling them short, but uh, that is used to do, like do socket, socket, and then socket dot listen, and then socket dot accept or or bind. Now, in his own language, without changing anything, he can do these things. So that's the first part, and now let's talk about fun things that we can do. And a little disclaimer: everything that I'm going to show you, you can already do it with like systemd run and then batch script and everything. I'm just showing you how you can do things that may not be the best way to do them, but again, you can do it from a high level perspective. So the first thing that I really like when I start working with system D and the things, I really wanted to have this idea that I could decorate a method, like for instance, this ping over here, that it could be like even like a normal call. And then I wanted to decorate and then just run this section of the code in a different C group um, or even in a different process. So I actually went on and did a few things. Uh, this will all be available on the PCMD page, um, so it has um, repository. Right now they are not because I read, write them only for this talk. So my idea was that I could decorate this method and then make this method run without any network access. Uh, the idea of this is that sometimes you have to run you know, like non-secure code or code that users provide. So it would be a good idea to just make this thing run in a different C group. And again, this is not the best way to do it, but it's a at least interesting way of doing it. So yeah, so this is how I solve it. I decorate that, and then what that will make, it will start a unit that it just a, a, big, a really big no-op. It has remain after exit true. Uh, I really know that you don't need to do this, but I just put it that as an example. Um, so remain after exit true. So this will execute this, will not do anything, and then will stay there. And then you set the type one shot. You set the type delegate to true, and then you set the, the, the C group settings that you actually want to preserve. And then you start your settings, your, your, your method. To start your method, I do a little trick that is the following. In a main process, I start this as a child, I fork. The great thing about doing the fork is that I can still hold all the status or all the variables and all the information that I have from the main process. So I have, like, if I declare a global variable, it's available to these methods. But I start, I wait for this thing to actually start to have a PID. And then I call this little great thing that is called attach process to unit that basically will allow me to make this process move them to this C group or to this other process. Uh, yeah, assume that I say something that makes sense. So, um, so what? So then, 
this is what happened in the parent. And then in the children, I start the process. I wait for actually to change the unit and to be running on a different unit. And then I call the methods. Uh, what this will do is two things. The first thing is that I can call this. And then when I try to ping, uh, it will not allow me to ping. Even though my application does have this permission, by me changing to a different C group, it works. This is not the best way to do it, but it really, it really works good for this. The other thing is that now, since this works in a different process, you can literally just do systemctl status, the other process, and then you will see this running. And then this gives you all, all the information that you want. So yeah, so this was one, one cool thing that we did. Um, I think, OK, never mind. Um, I'm assuming I still have time. So other thing that I have is that uh, just a raise of hand, because how many people here are, are Python developers or code in Python? <gasps> I love you all guys. OK, so, um, okay, so I, I'm not going to preach to the choir. In Python, you have this idea of virtual environments, right? Which allows you to basically set a similar but different environment that you have on your system with Python. So you can imagine that there's an, an, an analogous concept to the idea of portable services, but having portable Python environment. So instead of you just shipping like a whole system, like a whole distribution, thank you, uh, like a whole distribution, you just chip like your Python code. Uh, you just chip the Python executable and the live Python. And then through the magic of just setting up stuff, uh, you can make it run uh, in a way that is completely isolated from the Python that you have. And this is one example of how we do this. But for instance, you can just start a temporal file system. That's awesome. And then you just pin mount all the Python that you bring from your application. You just mount it into this environment. So you can mount the, the literally the binary. And then you can mount whatever libraries you want to preserve. Uh, then you do a few configurations, and you run. And then it's a good way to actually create virtual environments on the fly in the system D, uh, in a system D context instead of doing virtual M. So this was actually really cool. Um, with this said, you can do the same thing. It doesn't have to be Python. One other thing that we have tried is that actually instead of doing this, is Bash. So we can actually make a, when a developer, for instance, wants to try, like they have their own settings that looks really similar to production, but they actually want to try uh, change interchanging libraries uh, with the ones that they are developing. We change this to Bash, and then the mounts just change the location where the library should go with the developer one, and it works really well. The good thing is that this works in the context of the process, and then when you exit the process, it goes out. And again, the magic here is that you create PTYs, and then you bin uh, STD in, STD out. Uh, this is the last example that I will give, and I think with this, I will be running out of time. Uh, and I think I really want to have questions at the end. So one typical thing that we usually do as, as a infrastructure people is that we need to, for instance, we have to decommission a whole rack of machines. So for that, if these are databases, you usually need to drain them, then take the data, put it in somewhere else, and run it. And the first thing that you do is you create a batch script. You SSH from a scheduler, you execute that batch script, but then that batch blocks. So you block the thing, and then you, don't, you cannot actually run more than a few because you don't have resources to run them. Um, so the first thing that developers do, and I've been guilty of this, is that they say, oh, so I'm going to create a service that is going to be listening. And then it's, when it gets a call, I'm going to sub-process something, create it. And then this is going to start working. And then I'm going to monitor what it's doing. And when it's finished, I'm going to call back the main process. And every time that I get that, it's like, that's a service manager. Why would you code that if you already are running in Linux with a service manager? So a good way to do that is that instead of doing that, just write your same shell script that you have, do a little bit, do a little more interesting stuff, but literally just run it as a transient unit. So like this could be like a normal unit, and then you just start it. But if you want to create this file on the fly and do all those stuff, uh, you could literally just create a, as a service, uh, sorry, as a transient unit. You give all the attributes that you want. You can put a, you can put limitation into your script, change the user, and the good thing is that you should always try to use notify when it's possible. The reason why, well, so this is non-blocking, and then you just return the name of the unit that you created, and then you just monitor that unit. Now, how do you monitor that unit? One thing that you could do, and it's not really useful, but then you could use like notify. 
So notify you say ready equals one, it gives you like the status, but uh, what if you can put text into it? And you can, like you do, like don't over abuse this, but uh, like in your, in your backup script, you go through your backups, and then every time that you make a change, you change the status. If you do that, then if you, run, if you monitor your service through normal tools, you will always see the change that you did. Uh, then you can actually get it from the text. But that means that your scheduler, what it can do, it can always kind of go and connect to that particular unit and then retrieve the status text. And this is useful when you create interfaces, like, like human interfaces. Like you allow the script that is doing the backup to communicate how it's doing the things. Uh, that way you can read it. Um, that's mainly it. Um, I will not touch that one. Ask me later if you want to about that. Final thing is that binding to systemd, sorry, sorry, binding to leave systemd is fun. You should all do it. Find a language that doesn't have a binding, do it yourself. And that's it. So thank you, and questions. I have one minute, so at least one question or none. Go for it. So I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you showed before that there is some auto-generated code out of the uh, D-Bus introspection stuff. When is that happening, like at build time? Oh, so uh, in, in, in my library, you can do whatever you want. You're free to write yeah, no, your library whatever you want. Your... It's here. It's like when this with, you create the object, and this with in Python world, it's execute a method that is called enter. And that method enter, you get go to system, go to the library, sorry, go to system D, Go to Divas, call the instruct method, get the XML, construct the object, and then you return the object that you constructed. The only the good thing is that these interfaces are really stable, and you only need to do this once. Uh, we don't do it; we do it every time that you create an object. But you can only can only need to do that once. Okay. Uh, and the second question was like, if I'm not wrong, there are a few um, uh, function library functions that are asynchronous already in systemd. Oh, yes. Uh, how do you, so, and that one has like its own event loop, I think. It's like, how do you bridge with the Python asynchronous stuff? So I don't, but I will. <laughs> So yes, uh, the, that's the one. So the first thing that I create this library, I create with the specific intention that Python 2 has to be supported, which everybody in the Python world hate me for. Um, and Python 2 doesn't support, I think, IO like out of the box. So now that we're moving into a Python 3 world, it's like I will do, I think, IO, and I will make this library completely, I think, if you want to. Like, it's not only so. Cool. You're welcome. Cool gentleman in the front that I don't, that I have never seen. <laughs> uh, on that slide right there, what is replace? Oh, so um, that is basically like the start and the stop method. They um, this is like systemd from your sub, so Leonard can give you the better answer than that. But they take arguments on how you want to start, like how do you want the manager to actually start or stop your service. And the uh, most typical one is replace. Go ahead. It's basically if you start a service um, and this contradicts with another operation that has been queued um, before, what shall happen? Shall the new operation replace the older ones or shall the new yeah. one fail or something like that? So I, I want I want before you, if you have a question before you ask it I want to say like this is actually was one of the coolest thing about working in this type of library is that you get to learn like, quote unquote how these things actually work how the sausage is made because you get to like like you I call this method doesn't have arguments like what and then you say like oh there's all these options there's like three options I believe go ahead. Uh, my question was regarding, like, um, if you go, uh, yeah, on, on this slide here, like, um, you're saying that the introspection happens at the time the, the object is allocated, right? Yeah. So this works for any any DBS service? Yes, literally. So, so, so it, how, it, how would that look like if I, let's say, talk to, um, I don't know, network manager? Or oh, yeah, so, so it, I don't have example for this. Let me see if I can get this one. Uh, so basically, this is how the magic work. You, like, I have... Sorry. OK, so this one, it's like a custom object made understand that is the concept of unit. But I have an object where, where uh, this inherits from that basically allows you to specify any, any uh, service and any object. When you read that object and you see the XML, I, underst I understand that everything that, like, 
if it is or.free.login.one, I understand that every, every interface that starts with that, it's uh, like an interface proper of the object. So I exposed it like the thing as a proper attribute. So then you have like your object that you created, dot unit, so dot user would be this one. And then it, you will see it, like it works like that. And then the method works. And the other one that has different names, they are not exposed as uh, separate attributes, but you can always like get interface and then give the proper name, and then it, they will have it. So what's the work then, then let's say, if I want to talk to Network Manager um, or what, any other Dbus interface, um, what would I do? I would first subclass this generic object thing, fill like a handful in of things, and then that's it, right? That, the rest yes. happens automatically. Yes, exactly. But in general, like you don't even have to subclass it because the base class, like it works on its own. You have subclass it like to make like future calls, not necessarily to actually give the the name. But you will literally just if you want to talk. For instance, I do this a lot. Like with machine with machine one, you give this one, and then you give the object that would probably be either the machine manager or the machine or the machine itself. And then, like you say, everything works like right off the box, except for stuff like time date, which are like really small, and they don't really confirm this logic. Uh, we can talk about that later. But, but for things like, like machine CTL or login, which are like really big classes, and, and they like work like exactly like systemd1, perfect. OK, sounds great. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have time for more questions. I don't have time for more questions, but...